Hi, Charles. Hi there. Hello. 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 another line with at and and I've got to get my issue settled. Oh, okay. So I'm going to have to do earphones and because I don't want to miss your class. Okay. Well, I'm hoping you might hear something that might be useful. Yes, I'm anxious. I've got to do improve my landscapes. Yeah, well, we're going to we're going to take a bit of a deep dive discussion you know, about painting landscapes. And actually, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to show you some work. Well, actually, uh, John sent in an artist who was pretty good, you know, does a lot of trees, water, stuff like that. We're going to talk about him a bit and look at some of his stuff, but we're also going to look at a Russian painter, um, okay. which I've been threatening to show you guys for a while, and I'm going to get around to doing it. His name, his last name is Shishkin, but uh, excellent, excellent landscape painter. Probably not anybody on the planet who's done better. He's uh, nothing short of a pretty amazing artist, actually. And when you look at the volume of work that he did, mind-boggling. Wow. So, um, but yeah, we're going to take a look at him. And uh, we're going to talk about water and reflections and trees and shapes and light and shadow and skies and all that fun stuff. We're going to look at all that so that maybe you guys are a little more, I guess, aware, but also uh, you can make, make some different choices about what you choose to put in what you choose to leave out. So yeah. We're just waiting for people to get here. All three of you right now. Wow. Well it is two oh one. Hmm. All right. Well we're not gonna wait long. So we're gonna get going. Uh so the first thing I'm gonna do uh as I uh had promised uh I'm gonna show you this this uh, German painter who was very good. Um, and then I'm going to show, show you a little bit of Shishkin's work and we're going to take a look. Uh, we're going to stop at a couple of his paintings and talk about them. So, uh, let's see. Yeah. Let's look at this young man right here, Heinrich. All right, if we can just get Heinrich, Heinrich's window to open up here a little bit. All right, and uh, there you go. Uniconverter makes things simpler.
Okay, I'm gonna stop it right here. And I want you to just take a minute. I want you to really look at this uh, particular painting. Now this is pretty much so everything we've ever talked about in landscape, right? Uh, if you notice what's happening in the foreground. Talk to me. <laughs> it's more detail. Right. The, yeah. the color intensity is greater. Right. And what else? Darker color, but more value. Well, yeah, there's more value contrast. Uh, if you squint your eye down, okay, and look at it overall. Uh, this little area of the rock right here, okay? Notice how dark that is. And what does mm -hmm. it sit against? It really sits against maybe not mm. the lightest, but one of the lightest areas in the whole painting. Right? So what does that tell you? Okay. That's this, this little area right here is the area of highest contrast in the whole painting. Okay? And so when you're looking at that, you know, and you're comparing like this to some of the values up in here, the contrast isn't quite as great, okay? I mean, it's close, but it's, you know, these darks in here are really not as dark as this when you really, you know, begin to squint your eye down. And then look what he does. You see, you know, this group of trees generally kind of fall into a darker value range. Even these supposedly lighter tree trunks are really not all that light. If you squint your eye down, that light is actually darker than the values behind it. Okay, you notice that? So you see, again, you know, it, it kind of creates a break in the contrast, you know, the foreground being in shadow and then the middle ground, you know, being in full light, and then the background also being in full light, okay? And so, you know, the color is more intense here in the foreground, you see more texture, you know, if you wanna call it detail, you, you know, you can call it that, more sharp edges. And then as it moves back, see these edges, even in these trees and things, begin to get a little bit blurrier, right? The color is not quite as intense. It's grayed down just a bit. Overall, the value is generally lighter. Okay? And then as you move even further back, you know, into like this mountain and some of these trees back here, again, he's muted that color way, way back so that it's even more muted than this, right? And so you get this depth. You know, this succession, you know, of areas in the painting that, you know, react to make you think that there's three-dimensional space there. Okay? <coughs> and so you could look at this painting and you could learn everything you ever needed to know about creating space, you know, in a, on a canvas. So, because it's got all of it, every bit of it, okay? Um, so we'll keep, keep going on, because he's got others. But just notice, you know, what he's doing, you know, like in the background. He sprayed that down against Yeah, here's a here's another example. Okay. And he's using the same devices, you know, in, in most of his painting. You know, it doesn't change uh from that recipe or that formula if you really want, uh very often. But you know, usually the foreground 
is more in shadow and that sets up a contrast in value with the background that he keeps generally more muted and lighter. Um, and so, you know, your, your foreground, middle ground become kind of a screen and then, you know, the background's popping through it. Um, again, you know, he's putting in the, uh, the suggestion that there's more detail, you know, in, in the front area. And then as he moves back, things get a little bit softer and a little bit more simplified, right? Um, and the thing I really like about this guy's work, you know, when you, when you really start looking at it and studying it, uh, all of his trees have very individual personalities to them. You know, he's really kind of thought them out, um, you know, and studied them very carefully and, and made them look unique and individual. Even if it's the same type of tree, you know, it's, uh, you know, the trunks are doing something different. You know, they're not just repetitive uh, and doing the same thing all the time. So he's, he's really put a lot of thought and care into all of his work. Say what? He painted mostly trees because I'm looking here at everything, yeah. all his paints. It's all trees. About trees. It's, it's trees and deer. Occasionally, I mean, I think I saw like four paintings that maybe had a human figure in it. You know, it's, it's mainly trees and deer. And the thing is, it's like every painting he has a deer stuck in somewhere. You know, <laughs> you, you got to kind of really look for them sometimes, but they're there for scale. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to stop it right there for a second. Okay. Again, this is another one of those paintings. Um, and this one has, you know, a different focal point rather than the trees and the water and stuff. You know, he, he's put the deer in there and he sort of made them the focal point, which 
for him is kind of unusual. They're usually just uh, in there for scale. But again, you know, I want you to squint your eye down and look at how he handles the foreground, the middle ground, and then the background, right? And the foreground is pretty much so everything here in shadow, right, along this ridge here, uh, and then the cast shadow here. The middle ground is really kind of where the light starts, you know, back to the crest of that hill. And then the background is from there, you know, further back. Um, but again, you know, that middle ground is in, you know, fairly intense light. And you can see, you know, the light hitting, you know, these trees back here, you know, behind these larger, you know, trees there. Um, and again, squint your eye down and you'll find that the, these tree trunks, even though, you know, your initial impression is that they're very light, they're nowhere near as light in value as the colors behind them. Okay. You know, those yellows and, and oranges and things like that are actually, for the most part, lighter in value, um, you know, than, than this tree trunk, which if you just look at it, it appears to be pretty light, but then you squint your eye down and it's really much darker than you would think it is. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's my point about value, okay? And about how oftentimes when we're working, you know, we're trying, you know, we're trying to make a painting, you know, we think a lot about color, but color can be any value, right? And you can have uh, kind of a pale green that's considerably darker than, you know, a yellow or an orange or another green. Um, you know, you can also play with the value and the intensity, you know, of one area against another. In this case, he's playing with the value, but he's also playing with the intensity. You know, the tree trunks here are lower intensity, and then he's increased the intensity behind it, which also help that, helps this area back here look like there's light hitting it. Okay. And, it, and it, it just enhances that effect of sunlight, you know, hitting this area and not the tree trunks themselves. And so there's lots of different things that you could do, you know, to, you know, play with the illusion optically that something is moving forward or backward in space. And that's all it is, you know, that's, that's all you're doing is, that's the whole point of, you know, if you're doing a representational painting of any sort, you're trying to describe the light, right? And what light is doing within the space and the objects that you're painting. And it doesn't matter whether it's a portrait, a landscape, a still life, because even still lives have depth, you know? They may not have as much depth as this painting right here, but they do have depth, yeah. Again, you know, uh, a really good classic example of fabric is at Michael's, and we've got the lowest everyday price. Okay, Michael, let's see. Ninety nine per yard. Quilting fabric starting at four ninety. Yeah, let's move on to Ivan. Okay, we're not going to start it right away, but there. Those are um, beautiful paintings. Yeah, they were. Okay, and if you think that his were beautiful paintings, really? you'll you'll really like. Uh, Ivan Shishkin uh, a lot and wow. they've got a lot of his paintings we're not going to look at all of them okay but we're going to look at some and I'm going to do kind of the same thing talk about kind of the concept and how you know how he's approaching uh, the subject of landscape because landscape you know we kind of take it for granted you know we look around we see it all around us but we don't really think about how we would paint it, you know, how we would really make it look, you know, mm -hmm. and feel like we're there in the landscape, okay? So uh, let's take a, a real quick, maybe about a five minute look at Ivan out of the 33 minutes that he's got on here.
going to stop this right here. All right, again, what's going on? Look at the space. See? Oh, how did, how beautiful did, tree. Pardon? Beautiful tree. Yeah. But how is he convincing you that that tree is further away, you know, than these, you know, weeds and flowers, you know, growing along the roadway? Not detailed as much. Well, it's size relationships, right? You know, we've all, we've all seen trees, right? And we know that trees are big things, right? And yet, you know, if you measure from here to the top of that flower, right, it's almost half the size of the tree. See, or at least a third of it, right? Well, and the width of the path helps too. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, and how the path goes back and narrows down right. until it just you know how becomes. It to yeah, it just kind of you know disappears. Right. right. Okay. And again, um, you know, we were talking about composition this morning, and look at what he does. See, I mean, if you look at this. You have a you know a line coming in from the left, moving downward, right. You have a line coming in from the right, you know, moving slightly upward. You have this path which is moving backward and curving, right. So you see, he's giving you different elements of the landscape, and what is it doing? See, it's pulling you in. It's bringing your eye, you know, into the center, you know, of this painting, you know, so that you can follow this road back past that flower, right, to this tree, right? And he's not done with you yet. See? No, the depth of the, the water behind it. Right, yeah. See, you know, he stops you here at the tree, and what is it, what happens? You see, you kind of float around here, and you kind of move up into the sky, and then back here into the background. And you start just kind of moving and kind of your eye keeps moving all the time. Because none of this is just flat color, see? He's made every part of this, you know, some kind of variation, some kind of texture pattern, um, so that it doesn't feel like it's like a smooth manicured lawn. You know, it feels natural. It feels like it's out there in nature. There's rocks and gullies and uneven spots and um, you know, all the things that you would sort of expect to see, you know, in a landscape. And see, he moves you back all the way through the distance here, off into this, you know, distant mountains. It's really kind of the furthest point away is really kind of back in here, right? And really right at the horizon line, you know, where those mountains are, you almost lose them right into the sky. See, they almost just mush together. You know, there's no, there's no crisp, hard edge there, you know, defining where the mountains, you know, began and the sky, you know, begins. It's, it's all kind of mushed together, you know, so that it really pushes that back and gives you some sense of atmosphere and distance, right? <laughs> talk about this a little bit later um, but I'll look at the light and where the light is coming from see the light is coming in from the right and behind all of these trees right 
and everything in the background and the middle ground is lit up. Everything in the foreground is really in shadow. So it's, it's the same kind of uh, concept or, or format that uh, Heinrich, is it Balmer or something like that, used in a lot of his paintings as well. See? But, you know, it's very effective and it, you know, it separates out, you know, middle ground, background, you know, from the foreground. <laughs> Now there's a painting that any impressionist would die for. Look at look at the use of the color in the background. That blue violet. How that just kind of sings against the greens and kind of gold and orange colors, the reds. And again, see all all of the variation in color is really in the foreground. And what he's done is he's treated the background all, almost monochromatically. See, and it really just, you know, made it value. But it's all this blue violet back there. And you see, it simplifies it to the point that, okay, you know, that's what's going on back behind all this area that's closer to us with all this color and texture and, and things like that, so. stop this from here um, and again you know you've seen me paint trees and skies and things like that now I want you to look at the water okay. and what do you see going on in the water reflection, reflection. Right. Yeah. Calm, calm water. right yeah it's a mirror you know that's exactly what it is it's a mirror you know He's got a body of relatively still water there. And, you know, it's almost like he just turned the canvas upside down and painted the very same thing he did here, you know, just kind of mirrored and made the values about two, two values darker. See, you know. None of the value ranges or intensity or things are as bright or as intense in the water as they are up here, right? But it's almost an exact mirrored image of it. Again, just slightly darker, not quite as intense, okay? And the thing is, if, if you go out uh, and you're, you know, around a body of water that's fairly still, that's basically what you'll see happen, okay? You'll see all of that stuff reflected. The more still it is, the more it's more like a mirror. You know, when it gets a little bit choppy and stuff, then you get a little distortion in it, but, uh, you know. 
you know, we'll look at some uh, examples of that in a little bit. John? Yes. Once upon a time, early on, you were trying to do uh, a painting of, you know, a very similar to this, where you had yes. a cliff yes. and it kind of fell away to the water, right? Correct. Ah. Did you learn anything? That's, from not, mine. That's not mine. <laughs> no, no, no. This is not yours. Okay, but could you yeah, yeah. from this about how he made that, you know, the 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 grass area, you know, that that he's standing on, feel closer, and then the water and the landmass that's down below it feel further away. And that's where I had real difficulty in making it feel like it was on a cliff, right. looking downward. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I mean, it's almost, you know, in some ways, it, well, you didn't extend it. You didn't extend your land mass all the way back across the campus. It kind of ended somewhere back over there. But, right. you know, but it's, it's almost the exact same problem and almost a very, very similar composition, right? Yes. And again, it's a matter of values, lighting, you know, again, how he treated, you know, this foreground area you know, with, I guess you could call it a lot of detail, but it's really more textured pattern and, you know, it's more distinct in value and contrast. And then, you know, to get the rest of this to move back, generally, you know, he masked it together as a, a dark shape. And the thing is, if you really begin to look at this, you'll find that this is not all the same dark value and it's not all the same temperature. You know, there's warmer and cooler areas in there. Um, and then as he pushes, you know, things further back to this section of the landmass, again, and he's done this before, where it almost becomes monochromatic, right? You know, it almost becomes just a series of blues and blue grays, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And it, and it helps move it backward you know, in space because it holds together really not as, you know, a group of objects, but as a shape. Okay? And it's simplified. Okay. But, you know, I thought now we talk about when you want to move things back that they're darker in the front and as it goes back, it, it's, yeah. a lot, it's see, lighter. Yeah. And see, you guys need to get that idea out of your head. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't have anything to do with the value. It has everything to do with the amount of contrast. See? Okay. If you look at this area, okay, it is darker than the sky. It is darker than the water, right? But when you look yep. at the contrast in this area and the intensity of the color, which is pretty low, right? and you move slightly forward, all of a sudden the contrast gets quite a bit higher, doesn't it? Definitely. Yeah, see, so there's a very distinct difference, you know, and the range of value, contrast, intensity, you know, all of that is much more prevalent in this middle ground than it is the background, right? Mm -hmm. And then, 
when you compare this to what's going on in the foreground, okay, so you've got generally a darker shape and mass. This is lighter. So this sets up more contrast between this area, doesn't it? Definitely. Yeah, so the greatest contrast in the whole painting is really kind of right in this area, you know, where these two come together. And then, of course, he gives you more texture, more detail, more variation in temperature, you know, these warm kind of yellow greens against these blue greens and grays, right? And so, again, you know, it, it widens that range of contrast out so that what you arrive at is the greatest area of contrast in the whole painting is really right in here. You know what I like that he's done that it is hardly noticeable is the birds on the left hand side. Yeah, the gold. Yes, yes. It will lead you out, and then very lightly you can. There's, there's at least two, three birds I see. Right. Mm -hmm. But but they're just. I mean, I realize they're there, but they're not distinctive. But it's just enough to get your attention to crawl back into the uh, into the center of interest of the painting. Yeah, it could be, yeah, he, he kind of, you know, brings you, I guess, for me, when I look at this, I come in, I go to this rock, and then I move back, right? And then I want to go to this bird, and then I want to go down, and then I want to come back across, you know, to the beach again, and then back out. You know, you just keep weaving in and out of there. And again, it's, so simple, it's barely noticeable, but, but, it's, but it is there. Yeah, but, you know, and I talk a lot about this, uh, you know, particularly in landscape painting. It's, uh, you know, sometimes it's just these little hints of color, just little tiny hints of color that can really help you, like, move something forward. Like, for example, just this little touch of this blue violet right here. And then if you look in here, there's little touches of like oranges and yellows and reds and things, you know, sprinkled in throughout that grass. You know, that again, it's just that little touch of intensity and it pops forward because it's the most, really the most intense color in the whole painting. Mm -hmm. And you can barely mm -hmm. see those are basically warm colors, though, in contrast to the trees, which are cool colors, correct? Well, yeah, you have, uh, you know, these kind of warm yellowy greens and oranges and things here. And right. you look here, yeah, you have darker greens and darker in value, but also generally a little more bluish uh, and neutral, right? Where this is right. more and more intense generally okay so back to the drawing board <laughs>
Okay. I think, uh, I think we'll end Shishkin on this happy note. So again, you know, look at the composition, what's going on, see? You know, he's taking, you know, bringing you in from the right, you know, back through the center, back to, you know, these hard edge objects, right? This house and the more, you know, bright and intense colors, you know, in this area. And then behind that, again, everything is softened and it's brayed down, right? But to give you this sense of depth, you know, coming forward, again, he gives you a little more value contrast. He gives you, you know, more intensity in the color. Um, and then, you know, more texture. And again, you know, that suggestion or that illusion of detail. It's not really there. You know, he didn't really sit down and paint every little blade of grass. But he's got a good suggestion you know, that it's there. And he lets you go ahead and take that idea and fill it in and make it your own, so. And that's the thing, you know, was with, you know, you could look at Shishkin's work, it would, to see all of Shishkin's work, it would take you literally a couple of weeks. Because I when mean- When did he live? Uh, he was in the 1800s, uh, 1800s through I think the, probably like the 1920s, you know, probably up until about World War, uh, uh, probably about World War I, okay? I'm 1832 uh, to 1848. Oh, only 48? Okay. 1898. Pardon? 1832 to 1898. 1898, okay. Yeah, I was about to say, you know, I mean, all total, you know, if you want to see a guy who put out a ton of paintings, Shishkin is it, you know. I mean, he literally got thousands of paintings. And they're, you know, well, you know, I can't say that none of them are bad. I haven't seen all of them, but, you know. But I mean, he's really, really, he's, he's a really good, competent painter. Um, and landscape, you know, yeah, I mean, he, you know, he understands landscape, you know, as, as good as anybody who's ever painted it, so. Do you think he's at a studio or a plein air? Uh, well, you know, the tradition, you know, in Russia, uh, you know, they had classical studio training, but uh, for landscape, you know, they did a lot of plein air painting. And, uh, you know, this actually might be a plein air piece. And then he would take it back to the studio and he would, you know, kind of fashion a, a like a studio painting from it. You know, I'm I'm guessing this is probably a plein air. You know, look what it, he does it, to the back to the background behind the building, mm -hmm. and then up above that is the coloring. It, how how much it goes back with a similar. It, that is that's something else. Yeah, that's, it, really. Yeah, it's just it's just tweaking talk about all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just tweaking the color just a little bit and lowering the intensity just slightly. Right. I'm sorry, what? I said it's surprising how far back it really looks like it goes. Mm -hmm. There's the trees from behind that the red building. Right. And then yeah. you got a little more trees and then further back still more. It's it's right. quite a Mm -hmm. yeah. Built up distance with just the same color. Well, very similar, down. but slight shifts in intensity, okay? But also keep in mind, it's not just that he shifted the color, he's also shifted the size and proportion and scale of things. Yeah. See? Again, so he, yeah, see, he's giving you different size, you know, like here, you know, things right. get softer, but. You know, they all seem smaller. Here they seem yeah. a little bit larger, right? Yeah. Here they yeah. seem even bigger, right? And yeah. here they seem even bigger. And as it moves forward, you know, the things that you would expect to, you know, get larger in scale do. And um, and so it, it keeps pulling it closer and closer to you. Yeah. So that's amazing. That's right. Just that little area. Yeah. 
anyway, um, my suggestion is that, uh, you know, you take, a, yeah, you take a little bit of time and, and go look at Ivan and, uh, and check out, a, you know, I'll, I can give you a whole list of uh, Russian artists and Russian art doesn't get talked a lot about in the West and it's a disservice to painters here in the West because they were just so incredibly good, you know. Um, actually, people who studied in Leningrad, you know, at the academy uh, in Leningrad were as good, if not far better technically than most of the French painters. They really were. I mean, it just mind bogglingly good uh, painters, and particularly when it came to areas of landscape and figure. You know, they were very, very strong in both of those areas. So, uh, you know, I'll be introducing you to other Russian or artists like Kromskoy and, you know, Repin and all the rest of them. Um, and there's only about, you know, 20,000 of them. Uh, so, yeah, it's endless. Uh, again, but you know, beautiful, beautiful stuff. Okay, so uh, that kind of concludes the the video part of this. Uh, now I'm going to share with you. Uh, hey, hey. Yes. Before you move on, I just want to ask a question about um, you know, if there's a lot of trees in the background, even if you're outside, uh, off from a painting, you know, a lot of trees are in the, me in the middle ground. There's a lot of trees in the foreground. How do you know how to paint that? first layer to show those trees that are in the background. Well, how did he, how did either of these artists do it? I have no idea. <laughs> did you take the time to kind of look at that? Not yet. I mean, we talked about it. Okay. Okay. So the trees that are further that, that, back. That, that, that must have been this morning when I didn't, I didn't get the no, class. No, that was here. We stopped and talked about it several times. Okay, but oh, really? listen, listen, okay, very carefully, right? So okay. it's all a matter of contrast, right? So the mm -hmm. colors, you know, in the trees in the background are more muted, right? There's less mm -hmm. contrast in value and in intensity and in temperature. In Shishkin's uh, case, in several paintings, what he did is he made them all kind of a monochromatic painting, you know, to this blue violet or blue, right? Uh, you know, he pulled all those colors very close together and that really pushed everything back because it unified it kind of as a shape, right? <clears throat> and that shape was less intense, less contrast. Also, it would really sit back there. As they got to the middle ground, well, the shapes and the sizes of the trees and the colors you know, shifted and, you know, they, they got a little bit bigger as they came towards you, right? Mm -hmm. So the closer it was, the bigger tree it was. The further away, the smaller tree it was. Um, and then as he moved into the foreground, then the trees were, you know, really big. In many cases, you didn't see the whole tree, you know, because it came right off the top of the canvas, right? indicating that it's much closer to you than the ones you're seeing in the background. Uh, okay. That's not quite what I'm asking. I'm, what I'm asking is, it, you know, cause as, as some of these paintings go, that, that was really pretty sparse in terms of how many trees there were. But some of them, they had uh, trees, you know, they have very dense trees. And mm -hmm. what I'm saying is, you're looking at them, you're looking at all these dense trees, you can't really see the, the shape of the ones that are in the very background. So how do you know how to paint those if it's densely populated with trees? Yeah, because, and, and if you can't see the individual shapes, then it all falls together into just a big shape. All of those trees together just becomes a shape and a general, like, color or, or range of colors. You know, so again, they kind of hold together and you know that they're all back there together. Does that make sense? Charles. Yes. 
I think she has the same question that I do. Mm -hmm. With your paintbrush in your hand, where do you start painting? Do you start with the background or do you just in, uh, put a general uh, uh, picture colors there and then go back and touch up each one as you want to? So where do you start? If I have my paintbrush, which area would I start first? That's my question. Okay. And we're painting in the studio or we're painting plain air? Either. Yeah. Well, yeah, well they're different. <laughs> They're two totally different animals, okay? Um, and here's why. Plain air, you have to get the big masses in very quickly and give up all the detail and just try to get the light and dark shapes, right? Because you have very little time to do that, right? Uh, in the studio, you know, you're working from a photograph which isn't going to change. You know, the light's not going to get lighter. The shadows aren't going to shift. You know, it's going to be there. Um, so in the studio, you have the luxury of being able to work, you know, like from the background to the middle ground to the foreground, if you want to. Um, I don't recommend that, by the way. <laughs> That's, you know, generally, um, and there's different thoughts about this. But... For the most part, I would say go to the area that you want to be the focal point. Start there. Oh, okay. Okay. You know, start in that area. Where do you want, you know, the person to look? If it's a particular tree or a rock or, you know, uh, you know, a, a hillside or water or whatever, start there. Okay. You know, and get that established and then work your way, you know, around. Uh, and as you do that, stay conscious that that area that you wanted to focus in, you've got to make everything else move backward or be less important than that. Which, no, means, has to go. which means that you're going to keep your edges softer, your color less intense. Huh? Yes? I have to go. I'm sorry. Bye. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Good one. Good one. We'll see you maybe Friday, okay? Uh -huh. All right. So anyway, let's, you know, and maybe I'll try to answer that question as we look at some of the, let's, yes. Okay, found it. All right. So here's some uh -huh. photographs. And I'm, I'm going to talk about these photos a little bit and what's going on and how you might, you know, learn from, you know, looking at these. So- My picture disappeared. Pardon? Uh -oh. My picture disappeared. It did. Ch Charles, I have a question. You moved on. Maybe I'm I don't not. Know. Hang on one no second, problem. okay. Can, can everybody other than Eloise see this landscape? Yes, I yeah. can. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Yeah, I'll check and see what I can yeah. do. Okay. Okay, I got it. You got it? Yay. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So you've got kind of an aerial shot here, or, you know, you're high up, right? And you're looking out over these buildings, you know, and the landscape and all the rolling hills. What do you notice about this as you move on? As it goes back. Say what? I say I see color changes as it goes back. Yes. And it gets softer. And the not back. just not just color though. The images are sharper up front. Uh huh. Yeah. So you have sharper edges. You contrast. Got, yes. It it all falls into that word contrast. You've got the greatest contrast here in the foreground, right? Right. And then, uh, Bernice, mm -hmm. okay, look at the trees. You have trees, uh, that, you have trees like, that are closer to you, right? And mm -hmm. look, look at the size relationship of the trees here versus mm -hmm. the trees back here. Right. Mm -hmm. And also sure. notice the change in color. You see, you know, there's mm -hmm. lighter areas, darker areas here, right? Now there's lighter and darker areas here, but 
the range isn't quite as far, is it? They're closer yeah. in value here than they are here. So you've got more, you know, more variation in value, again, because these are closer to you. So it's mm. the variation in value, but it's also the scale, mm -hmm. right? Which tells them they're bigger and closer to you, right? Because reality is we see these and these are trees. We don't think that these are all miniature trees back there, <laughs> right? We know that they're big trees and that they're in fact as big as these trees. They're just further away, yeah. see? But but the difference is see those those areas you know I I would I would attempt that, but mm -hmm. I see well when I'm look well, when I'm looking at background background trees through foreground trees and through mid ground trees you know yeah. when you look straight through a tree and you and you see all the back and all you see is trees mm -hmm. I I don't I don't I don't know what to paint first you know okay but okay look it doesn't matter. I mean, the same principles apply, okay? The mm -hmm. trees in the front are going to have more contrast. Mm -hmm. The trees in the middle ground are going to have less contrast. Mm -hmm. The trees that are way back in the background, you may not even read as trees. It may just be a shape or a color, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. See, the further back it goes, the simpler and less detail and the less contrast it's going to have. As it moves forward, the more detail, the more contrast it's going to have. Okay? Uh, what, what, what was the name of that first artist you showed? I, I need to show you. Uh, Heinrich, is it Balmer or something like that? Okay. I'll have to go back and, and look. I need to show you. Show you yeah. B O H M E R. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, um, let me show you the picture that I'm talking about. I got covered just trees through trees, you know. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But again, he used that same, you know, that same idea. The concept's the same. Okay. You know, it's like as things move back, it's like I'm sitting here looking out my window right now and I'm looking at, you know, layers of trees, right? And I can see ones that are over on the ridge, you know, away from me. And even though they're very similar greens to the trees that are close to me, the ones close to me have sharper edges, you know, more intense color. The ones that are further away over there on that ridge, they're a little fuzzier, you know, they're, the color isn't as intense. Um, and so again, it sets up that relationship, that distance, okay? Hey, Charles, can you go down to your fifth picture? And I think she can explain to you better what she's trying to say. The fish, fifth picture on that, yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank, thanks, lady. You're welcome, Bernice. <laughs> yeah, we were going to get there. But yeah. Yeah, and this is so kind of a situation. But OK, so you see the trees back here, way back in the background. You know, you know they're trees, but you don't see individual trees. It's just a gray shape, right? You know? So and that's then, the question. Where where do you start in that painting? Do you start by filling in that gray shape, the illusion of trees? Or she's asking, do you start with the trees in the foreground and then work your way back? Right. That's my question, too. Right. And in this particular case, what I would kind of encourage you to do, uh, you could put that gray back there, but then you've got to work over it with these darker colors, right? And so... I would do it just the opposite. I'd put these dark shapes down, and then I would fill in the grays and oranges. Actually, I do. I would do the dark shapes. I'd do the yellows and oranges and things, and then I'd gray that down, kind of get the area back in here. And then probably one of the later things I would do is this ridge, and the very last thing I would do is the sunlight and the really light, you know, coming through. You know uh, all the leaves. Because you would just it, lay, because, you would just lay the shapes of the trees and not the details of the trees. Right, exactly. See, right. because okay. you know what? See, if you begin to see this tree as a big shape and kind of a, a general value, right? And there's just a big shape there, 
and then you take the light and you start painting the spaces in between the branches. Okay. And before you know it, you have leaf textures, branches, things like that. And if you, let's say that you blow it, right? Let's say that you get light paint where you don't want it. Well, okay, you just take your, the end of your brush and kind of scratch through the light. And more than likely, you've got that dark color underneath there so you can let it come through again. See? So there's, you know, there's lots of different ways of doing it. Um, but since, you know, in, in this particular case, maybe this area would be my focal point, right? And what I said is, you know, start with your focal point. So I'd get the shape of that tree in, right? I'd get these, you know, kind of a big dark shape here. Uh, not for, you know, just one tree at a time, but just kind of think of them all as one big mass, right? Uh, same thing here, there's a big dark mass, a big triangle, right? Right in here. It's a little more kind of rust or orange at the top. It gets cooler and more green at the bottom. See, so I just block in that big shape. And then I can come back in, you know, with maybe some of the reds, you know, the oranges and things in here. Uh, maybe some touches of green, you know, and then some touches of gray, you know, and keep working back and forth until I begin to get the texture and, you know, pushing and pulling some of these areas, you know, either backward or forward. And again, you know, the last thing I would do is the sky, because it's the lightest thing in the whole painting, right? But you would have to use a, what, a fine brush or something to poke in those colors in between the branches and the leaves and everything? Yeah, you'd probably have to get a smaller, yeah, smaller brush. And, you know, what you'll find is you can put a few of those in there and you don't have to put them all in. You just put enough to suggest that that's foliage and that there's open areas in it, you know? Yeah, I mean, you're not, you're not gonna get everything exactly where you see it, you know? You're going, you're trying to communicate the concept, the idea, right? So, you know, after you get all that light in there, you know, then the next question is, what do you do with all these little tree branches here? You know, do you paint in between? No, you leave them out. Right? You don't worry about them. You just eliminate them. You know, and you get the light in there and then you maybe let it sit up and dry for a day or two. And then if you, you know, when the, when that paint is dry, if you want to come back in and start, you know, just kind of, you don't want to do them all. It's like folds. Just because you see a fold doesn't mean that you paint it. You only paint the folds that you really need. Well, just like all these little tree branches here, you only put in the ones that you really need. You don't try to put them all in. You know, because if you do, you know, you're gonna A, drive yourself crazy, and then B, it's not really gonna look right, so. It seems to me that since the majority, the larger percentage of the canvas is devoted to sky and that deeper color in the background, that you would do that first and come back in on top of all of the, other things, the trees and everything, like in construction, you just build on top of whatever is. So, yeah, you can go at it that way, but if you do that, again, the problem is you're trying to get darker values on top of that lighter paint. And what happens? You know, all that dark paint just kind of mushes into it. Before you know it, you have mud. If you let it dry. <laughs> <laughs> well, could yeah. I mean you could you could paint like just the gray area in the sky, and let that totally dry, and then come back in with the mid ground, and you know try to get all those colors in there, and then let that dry, and then come back you know and get the next layer and let that dry, and then you know do these, you know as a final, um, you know again, yeah you can go about it either way. Um, the more efficient way, like I said, is I would start with my focal point, you know, and my focal point would either be down here where the light is hitting the ground, 
or it would be up here where the light's coming through the tree. Hmm. And I would kind of start in that area. And again, that doesn't mean I would paint the sun first. What I would do is I'd put down, I'd just see that tree right there is a big shape. And then I'd see this is a big shape. And I'd see these trees right here is a big shape. Um, and get those in and then, you know, work into my midtones, you know, getting, you know, all this area in here and, and stuff at the bottom of the canvas in. And then I would get to the point where I'm getting, you know, my, my real lights in, which means this ridge back here and then into the sky, you know. And that's where I would start breaking up these shapes, you know, and adding textures and things like that to begin to make them look like leaves, tree branches, you know, whatever they are. Okay. Okay. Hey, Charles. Yes. How, how about acrylic? Do you paint the foreground first or your focal point first? Not yeah, I would still do the same. Right? Yeah. I mean, you could put in some big blocks. You know, um, you know when, I, when I was teaching classes over at Benson, you know, we were basically taking an a la prima approach. You know, because we weren't coming back and working on paintings, you know, week after week after week after week. You know, generally we were doing an a la prima, which is, you know, maybe one sitting, maybe two. And so again, you know, it's like get the big stuff first, you know, big shapes, right? You know, working into like smaller details. Okay. Uh, yeah, but acrylic, acrylic dries fast. Yeah. So you can put in the dark later within minutes? Uh, you, you can, but then it's really hard at that point to kind of control your edges. And that's why, you know, you always want to end on your lights, not on your darks. Okay, got you. Okay. Uh, we got water, right? Okay. Now the thing about water, if you look at this water, there's a lot of movement in it, right? I don't see the water yet. Oh, we're still on that last painting. Tree. You don't see water? Well, now I do. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. All it right. just came up. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, you know, you've got a body of water here. It happens to be the Chattahoochee River, right? And, um, you know, so you see a lot of the movement in the water, right? And you'll notice that, uh, you know, and particularly in like rivers and things like that, because the water's fairly shallow and it's fast moving, it changes direction. You know, all of those ridges and things move in different directions. You've got areas that are kind of smooth, right? And then you've got areas that are very kind of textured and rippled, right? And what's happening is that the water is reacting to what it's running over, you know, over the surfaces. And so when it hits something that it resists, you start getting a lot of ripples. You know, when the water's deeper and calmer, it runs more smoothly. But again, just like in, in any instance that we've talked about so far, you start looking here, you know, at the areas closer to us, and what do you see? You see more contrast you see more intensity in the color. As you move across the body of water, what happens? See, it calms down, right? You know, it gets simpler. You don't see the level of detail. The color begins to get a little more muted, right? So it's not, you know, it's, it's not all the same. Uh, here's another instance uh, looking at water, okay? And so, you know, you've got a, a sunset. And look at what happens, you know, from the, you get, again, more texture here in the foreground. As it moves back, it changes, right? It's, you know, it becomes more of just a, a flat color back here. You know, as it's coming forward, you're going to get, you know, more ripples, more movement. 
See, but it's not everywhere. And again, that helps you kind of create that illusion of distance and depth. Um, here's another instance of it, okay? So you're, you know, you're looking, you know, off here in the distance. What happens to the water here? See, not nearly as much detail, right? Up here closer to us, you know, you see the ripples, you see the contrast, right? Mm -hmm. And so again, you know, that tells us that this is closer to us. This is further away. Same thing with the trees, okay? Look here, you know, you got this big tree and you've got all this texture and things, you know, in the leaves. When you get back here, you know, you could really paint that, you squint down, you know, really just as a shape. Uh, you know, you really don't need to put in like a lot of detail here. You could put in a little bit. But when you get here, you know, you've got to kind of begin to bring these shapes out, you know, make them individual trees, see, in your midground, right? So as you come forward, you know, you're getting, you know, more detail. And the same thing with the ground. See, back here, further away, it's just a color. But as it moves forward, it becomes a color, a texture, a contrast. So, you know, that's reality. That's what happens. Um, you know, trees, same thing, right? You get a clearer, sharper image of what something is closer to you as it gets further away. You have to simplify it. <clears throat> you have to. You know, you, you can't put in all that detail. Um, okay. Yeah, I want to go to water. And, and then we'll come back and we'll look at the sky again, okay? So let's say that you're at the beach, okay? You know, same thing, you know, you've got water. Um, again, the waves that are closer to you are gonna be more defined. As it moves back to the horizon line, you see there's points at this horizon line here that it almost becomes the same color and the same value as the cloud. See, they almost mush together, you know. There's just a slight value difference, you know, and, and there is a fairly sharp edge along that. So again, you know, it tells you that, you know, that's much further back, you know, what's here at the bottom is much closer to you. Same thing here, okay. And light and atmosphere have everything to do with how you see things, you know, how sharp they are, you know, how much contrast there is. Um, you know, here again, see, you lose, almost lose that horizon line, you know, right there where the sun is, right? And one, you know, one just kind of melds into the other. Um, Now here, the contrast is a little more stark. Wow. How about that? Pretty. Yeah, beautiful. Oh, beautiful. Wow. Well, I like that one. That has a lot of movement to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's nothing static about nature. You know, nature is, you know, always moving, you know, always have has movement and contrast in it. And some of our photographs and paintings have a lot more movement than some of the others. Mm -hmm. Some are quiet like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this has kind of a, in comparison, kind of a quiet mood to it, right? Okay. But look, you know, you've got this, See, this is not trees, it's a shape. It's just a kind of a gray, blue-gray shape. And then 
you know, down here, it takes on a little sharper edge, um, a little bit darker value, you know, a little more clear. And then you hit the water, which is pretty light in comparison. And then the, the middle ground, right? You really becomes almost like a silhouette then, because the light's behind you. And then as you move to the foreground, so you get, you know, you get the light hitting the water, but you see it shows off the movement and the texture of the water. So it's like, you know, how would you paint that? You know, you, you've got to kind of think about stuff like that, you know. Um, you know, how would you paint that sky? Oh, this is beautiful. Wow. See? The clouds aren't white. Too many cars. <laughs> well, leave the cars out. You could put a field there, you could put a barn there, you could put anything, you know. But if you're if you're looking at the contrast, how light the sky is, how dark the mass of the land is, it's pretty stark, right? Uh, You're beautiful. How about that? Nice. That's my neighborhood. That's the lake down below my house. Oh, okay. Now the water, Ooh. you know, the water was very still that day. Mm -hmm. And well, literally, a it's a mirror. Pardon? Yeah. You got two skies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's a mirror. I mean, that's all it is. Uh, you know, it's absolutely a mirror. You know, one is reflecting the other. See all these trees and then the shapes of the clouds over it? And the reflected cloud is brighter than the uh, cloud in the uh, back or in the sky. I'm sorry, what? The reflective cloud in the water is a lot brighter in the sky than the sky's cloud. Even though it's reflected, it's got to be different. I don't get that. I actually get that the clouds, the lights up here, are much lighter than here. Squint your eye down, Gene. Squint. Well, the difference is this has more white in the bottom, and it looks brighter. Yeah, it does. The bottom one has more has more light. Yes, there is more contrast that makes the the this one in the sky look brighter, but the one down below it looks because it's more, it's larger in shape, looks yeah. brighter. But it's not quite as bright. It, the value is darker in the water than up here. On the now, my screen, it looks like the Now these rays in here get darker than the ones down in here. See, again, the reflection is, isn't gonna have as much contrast as the actual sky. Right. I mean, I know the cloud to, against the white in the sky is a lot darker, but mm -hmm. because of the size of the white in the reflection, it looks brighter than the one at the top. Yes. If you don't squint your eye, if you're just looking at a picture. Yeah. And that's, that, that's where you get in trouble, see, because your eye, yeah. if you don't exactly. squint down, exactly. Then, the, then you can't really read the value. Because again, when your eye is wide open, it can be deceived by the change in intensity or the change in temperature, you know, to make it look like it's got more contrast than is really there. And uh, yeah, that's, that's an age old problem with. You know. but plus, you got the camera. <laughs> well, yes, you have the camera, but again, the camera only sees, you know, I mean, it lies at times too. Well, it does, you know, because it's not, you know, it, your eye, you know, your eye is 250 times more sensitive than the very best digital camera out there. You can see more than that camera ever, is ever going to see, right? And in many ways, that's what's going on here. You know, these are photographs. So again, you're not seeing what I actually saw while I was there. Mm -hmm. This is Westlake um, Reservoir, by the way. <laughs> yeah. 
so you see, you know, water has different moods, you know, and again, see, the water isn't quite so still here. There's a little bit of wind, so it's a little bit choppy. But if you really look very carefully, squint your eye down, you'll notice that you'll begin to see all of those clouds and things reflected in the water. Mm -hmm. The same thing with the land masses again, kind of, you know, reflected in the water. See that tree. So they're always there. You know, the question is, to what degree do you see them? Because water really is a mirror and it, it reflects whatever's around it, see? Same thing here with the river, right? You know, again, because the water is moving a little more choppy, you know, when you really oh, yeah. look at this, you begin to see that, oh, okay, there really is a reflection of all of this. And then you get, the reflection of the sky from there forward, right? Mm -hmm. But that whole bank of trees is there, it's just distorted because the water's constantly moving there. Mm. Clouds are too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, let's see what else. And then of course you get, you know, to areas where there's like little creeks and things like that. And you know, it's like, how do you paint that? You've got to make it look transparent. In a lot of areas, you've got to make it look like you're seeing the bottom, you know, and a lot of the plants and things, you know, in the water. But at the same time, you know, you also have to get the light, you know, that's hitting the ripples and you know, things. And, you know, there's no foam or anything here. That's just, that's just the sunlight. It's reflecting the sky, you know, through all those different leaves and you know tree trunks and things like that um, and it's all you know it's kind of creating this pattern now notice that none of that is white no it looks like it has a lot of blues it does and yeah it's all it's all kind of you know light values lighter values again because it's reflecting the sky up above it so uh, let's see, you know, here's a pretty good example. Okay. You got a dock, you know, fairly no, still. I got the same picture, it hadn't changed yet. Pardon? Mm -hmm. I got the same picture with the, now it changed. Okay. Now it changed. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah, so you got a dock. I'm sorry? We have a delay. Yeah, we have a delay. But just wait, wait, wait two seconds and it catches up. Huh? I see. Okay. Um, but anyway, again, it's a mirrored image. So, you know, it's the water picks up and reflects everything that's around it, including the green grass back here. So, mm -hmm. Three. And the tree the yeah. behind the dock. Yeah. See, it's, it's not the dock. You got the tree behind the dock. And you got the tree behind that tree. See, and it's all being reflected in that water. You, 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 you would think that the chair was sitting on top of the dock that, the, that you wouldn't see the chair. I'm sorry, what? Since the chair was sitting on top of the dock, you would think you, the reflection would be the bottom of the dock and not the chairs. Well, you get a little of both. So you get a little of the bottom, but then you get the edge, and then you get the chairs up above. Yeah. Right. Or how about this? Okay. Same picture. Not when it comes up. <laughs> wow. You still got right. the top with the chairs. Oh, still now? Yeah. 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 Well, okay. <laughs> I guess I have to click in the picture to get it to register or something. I don't know. Sorry about that. But again, you know, it's a mirror. See? You know, it's just reflecting, you know, everything around it. The reflections are based on our line of vision, too. Because if yeah. we change the places, of course, it wouldn't pick up all of it. Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you were standing down the bank a little bit, yeah, the reflections would be... Is this know, near your house? No, no. This is actually uh, Sweetwater State Park. 
Oh, that's where you were, Eloise. That's where I, well, that's where I was this last weekend. We went over there on Sunday. Yeah, I think yeah. Eloise was over there earlier this week. Weren't you, Eloise? Yeah, yes. Eloise was the one who suggested it to me, so I took her up on her suggestion and went. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. it's first yeah. time I had been there. It's a beautiful place. You know. There it is. But again, you know, it's, it's look, you know, look at the sky, you know, look at the hillsides. And again, it's fully on the left in the water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, well, this is closer to you. And so, yeah, you're going to get sharper, you know, more detail here than you are back here. Because again, it's reflecting this, it's further away. Now, when it comes back to this area, see, again, you're getting more detail, it's closer to us. All right. See. Now the way it doesn't work is the thing, you know, the, the bank that we're standing on, we don't see that reflected in the water. Mm. See. Um, let's see what else can I show you. Uh, okay. Can everybody see a guy fishing? Not yet. Not yet? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I don't. I still see the reflection from the sweet water. Me too. All right, now I got the guy fishing. Okay. Yeah, evidently it is taking a little bit of a delay or something. I don't know. Um, okay. So, again, you know, very similar, same situation. The water is not perfectly still. You know, there's areas that are kind of quiet. But notice, you know, this whole bank of trees is being reflected in the water. So is this shape. See? Right there. See, that's being mirrored, you know, in that water. Okay? But because the water is moving and not perfectly still, or moving at a fast enough rate, you know, you're not getting as sharp an edge, you know, to your reflections and things. So it gets a little bit softer. And that's all it takes. It takes a little bit of wind, a little bit of movement, you know, again, changes the total mood, you know, of, of how the water reacts. Um, you know, here's a pretty good example. Give you guys two or three seconds. Anybody see a change yet? Nope. Now I do. Now we do. Got it. Yeah. So if you notice, look at that building and how it's being reflected. Notice right. how the tree here is being reflected, you know, in these, in the water, right? Now the water is not perfectly smooth. You know, it's got just a little bit of breeze blowing, you know, and just a little bit of ripple across the surface. But you see it distorts the image. Right. Right. Now if it were a very quiet, still day, that would be like a mirror, right? And you'd see, you know, every nuance of that building or that tree being reflected in the water itself. But you don't because you got just a little bit of movement there. Uh, oh, that's pretty. Where is that? Uh, that was in Missouri. Oh, Missouri. Yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, little, little piece of backwater along this river. It's called the Black River. Um, and so, again, you know, it's acting as a mirror, right? What is that, uh, like, leaf debris on the right-hand side in the water? Yeah, that's just leaves that have fallen off the trees. And it's just kind of, because of the current, it's pushed it up yeah. you know, against the bank. You know, hasn't sunk yet. I'm sure, probably we'll get around to it. When you tell it to it, I mean, by that I mean in comparison to the reflective, you know, down in your center of interest. I can't. Now, what was that again? The, the lead debris doesn't uh -huh. have any real color to it like the center of interest no. where the colorful trees are. Yeah. No, but it's, actually, 
Yeah, it's actually lighter in value. Yeah, just like though it would have had a little red or orange or yellow or something in it. You yeah, know. You could. yeah, yeah, you could sprinkle a little color in there. All right, can everybody see this? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Trees, river. Yeah, this is the Black River again. It's another section of it. And you can see the, the reflection mirror there too. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very kind of slow, meandering river. Yeah. It's nice. It's beautiful out in that area. Uh, let's see. I think a canoe in there, that'd be an interesting piece. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, probably the deepest spot in that river is probably about four feet. You know, I mean, it's it's very shallow, you know, kind of slow moving in that area. Uh, further up, it's got some rapids, you know, uh, kind of coming down and then down below it, you know, it's got a few rapids, but in that section, it's kind of quiet. Um, so anyway, you know, water, you know, water is one of those elements, again, can add a lot of interest, but a lot of, you know, can tell you a little bit about the mood, you know, uh, to the landscape. Uh, and then of course you've got the sky, you know, we've looked at some of the clouds and they're, they can be very dramatic or they can be very subtle. Um, you know, different times of day, sunlight, you know, where the sun is in the sky. Um, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, it's clear weather or whether it's, uh, you know, here's a, give you a, a moment or two. Wow. Oh boy. Oh, wow. Yeah, a lot of movement, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then notice how the clouds kind of move backward in kind of a V shape, right? And that helps draw your eye in. You saw Shishkin do it. You saw uh, Palmer do it. You know, again, you know, it's composition. See things, you know, to lead you back, you know, to mm -hmm. kind of the focal point, right? Right. So as you, as you, you know, if if you know, as a photographer, as a uh, artist, you know, you can make choices about how you take pictures of things and how you crop it mm -hmm. and how you position things and where you put them. Um. You know, whether you zoom in or, you know, pull back and get more of the image. Um, and so, again, you know, it has a lot to do with kind of the feeling and the mood of the image. Mm -hmm. so, again, you know, really nice dramatic sky. It's all being reflected in the water, you know. And then, of course, you've got this bird that's backlit. See, the light's actually coming through his feathers, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you get a sense of that by the change in color, you know, it gets warmer, you know, versus a cooler color. You know. That blue against that orange really looks outstanding. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they're direct compliments. Yeah, so, I know. Cool. Yeah, and so, again, the thing that makes this really interesting is that the temperature you know, of the quote unquote white, it's not white. It is more blue in this case against that warmer temperature. Again, not only creates a contrast in value, but also a contrast in temperature. And again, that's a much more exciting thing than just looking at the shift between light and dark. So, uh, you know, here's a, you know, there's some fairly typical clouds, right? Everybody see that? Yeah, mm -hmm. I got that one. Huh, got that one? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And again, you know, just like with trees and everything else that we've talked about so far, look at the parts of the clouds that are closer to you, right? See in here, you know, sharper edges, right? As they move back, what happens? They get a little fuzzier, don't they? Yeah. See, all the way back here, see? You don't find that many sharp edges, you know, back in here. See, this is all quite a bit softer. You know, really right in here, 
you know, that's your sharp edge, you know, there and right in there. Again, because they're coming towards you, they're closer to you. Okay. Uh, let's see what else. Somebody's backyard in Mexico. Those clouds in the center at the very top that are very thin. So those would be distant clouds? Well, these are actually closer to you, but they're much higher and they're a different kind of cloud. See, mm -hmm. these are like uh, stratus or cirrus clouds. And these are cumulus, I believe. Um, so yeah, these, these are kind of like cotton balls and these are just like thin sheets you know, of, of water vapor. So they're more transparent and, you know, and hazier. But again, you know, if you really kind of look at this, you know, kind of in this area, you know, some of the edges get a little bit sharper, but everything else is yeah, a little bit fuzzier, you know. Mm, not that many of you are going to lay on your back and look upward, but if you if you did, <laughs> used to do that as a child. Yes, as a child. Yes, that's not an uncommon viewpoint. As an mm. adult, the problem is you get down, you can't get back up. <laughs> <laughs> if you can get down to start with, that's the question. Yeah, you you have to get help. <laughs> get close to a tree. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, you've got a kind of a forced perspective. You know, you see the trees going up. And, and, you know, I mean, and it's pretty common around here to see cloud, you know, formations like that. You know, we've seen a lot of them, so. That almost looks like it's snow and you're on flying above the trees and looking mm -hmm. down. Yeah, kind of. So, so I guess, you know, uh, here, let's, let's end with a, a storm. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. You know, pretty dramatic, isn't it? Yeah. Now, if, if you had taken that picture on a bright sunny day, it wouldn't be a very interesting picture, would it? No. no. The contrast is what makes it really jump. Yeah, but you, you put that big, you know, thunderhead in there with the rain coming down in the distance, and all of a sudden, you know, it becomes a much more interesting dramatic painting, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. so, uh, I've got a, a twin up here. You got a rainbow. Yeah. Again, you know, not that interesting, really, you know, all on its own, you know, just if you just did the land mass, you know, there's nothing there that's, you know, particularly like, wow, I just really want to paint that. But then you add that sky and changes everything. So next time you guys decide to take on a landscape, or anything like that, you know. Uh, my request is you think about it. You look very carefully. You kind of think about what it is that you want to say about that landscape. You know, what, you know, is it calm? Is it threatening? Is the weather changing? Uh, you know, what's the light doing? What time of day is it? You know, there's, you know, tons and tons of questions you have to ask, you know, before you get to, uh, you know, putting a paintbrush, you know, down on the canvas. So, and there you go, Bernice, more trees. <laughs> See, trees, bond trees, bond trees, bond trees, bond trees, right? As far as you can see to the horizon line, nothing but trees. So you see back here, you really don't see trees. You just, but you assume. The house, so. Pardon? You see houses. You see houses? Yeah. Where do you like, see? Well, above the car and the blue, above the tree line, a little higher, right there. There's a house there and to the right. It looks like a house or instead of clouds to me. Yeah, to the right. well, oh. yeah, it's mist. <laughs> yeah, I, 
I, I, I can, uh, Gene, uh, I, yes. I can absolutely assure you that, I know that that there is not a human being out there from <laughs> about where that picture was taken to the horizon line. Okay. But, yeah. But what I'm saying from a real distance. Yeah. Can, that is, that is, that is in the fact. middle of the Ozark Mountains and the closest <laughs> civilization is five and a half hours away in any direction. It's got to be the Trolls Village. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. Uh, yeah. Well, but you could still make it into a little house, you know, make you yeah, do it your. Yeah, you can put houses uh, or anything. A yeah. barn or something way back yeah. there. Yeah, you can put anything there you wanted to, right. Charles, how would you make a picture like that interesting? Now, I s notice there's a car there, a vehicle there. Yeah, but that's if you just that, like that, there's no focal point or anything. So how would you make that interesting? You don't think there's a focal point? Not if the car is not there. Yeah, if, okay, so just cover up the car. And then what's the next big prominent thing here? Well, the tree, the suppose tree. The, the tree wasn't there, then what would you, what, what could then you make that? Uh, pardon? Pick something else. Where do you where do you want them to look? See? Let me, let me give you some ideas where you would the big, the big bush right behind the car. <laughs> well you could. You, know, you, take, you, the, you, take, you take the road out, that kind of road out, put a dirt road, put a big rock with a hill going yeah. back. Now that would make it interesting. Or, 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 you could, take, you could take these animals cross over the road. You could do a large little animal there, a couple of deers or something. And yeah, you could do a huge armadillo in the foreground. There you go. You could there not you leave go. that just like just uh, with trees and sky, right? Well, you could, but you know, you could push the contrast in the clouds a little bit. You could push the color, you know, well, uh, you here could in make the foreground. A large tree, like a uh, a. You could take it like the tree is in front of the car and just do the top half with a large, uh, colorful, like a, well, we had these uh, Bradford pear trees with the flowers on it. Mm -hmm. You could put that up in there, do anything. Yeah. But you wouldn't just leave it just open like that, right? Without anything. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah compositionally, it's not that interesting. Okay. Well, you, you know, you could, you could just crop it so you had only one of the trees, you have the tree on the left, and, and uh, the other end, um, about where the pole starts upward, and uh, concentrate on your co contrast and values and going back into the distance. I think that would be a nice, Good. nice composition. Yeah. And let me, let me point something out to you, okay? I mean, you can make a good composition out of this, uh, and maybe a focal point. Like you've got the big, you know, bush here, right? But look what happens behind it, see? You start getting this kind of shape that kind of snakes back through there and takes you back, you know, to this ridge. And then that ridge takes you down over here, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of pick up, you know, the ridge coming across, see? So there's lots of things you could do, right? You just mm -hmm. have to look at them and kind of figure out, you know. What we're doing with it? You know, how do I use it? You know, how do I make the most of it, make it more interesting? You know, the lighting and, and everything was not, you know, particularly uh, inspiring, you know, at that point in time. You know, I'd just woken up. I'd, I'd driven for almost uh, 17 hours straight to get there and got there early, early in the morning when it was pitch black. And uh, the last probably the last 20 miles of that, uh, you know, I hit, I almost hit deer about four different times crossing the road. I mean, they were, there were more deer there than there are people in Atlanta, you know, seriously. Uh, it was are you cool. using your, uh, your phone camera or you have a separate camera? No, no, that was, that was off the phone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I'm, you know, I was traveling like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah. The last thing I wanted to do was fill that car up. You know, I mean, I had a paint box in it, and I had probably about uh, probably about four pads of mixed media paper 
and uh, about 20 small canvases, you know, with me and some oil paint. And uh, yeah, I was just gonna go out and see what I could do, you know. So I, I spent, uh, what, about two and a half weeks on the road. And I went, uh, came, went from Atlanta, went to Tennessee, from Tennessee, went to Kentucky, from Kentucky, went to Indiana, then Illinois, then Missouri. Wow. From Missouri, I went into Arkansas, and then I went into Texas, and then I went into New Mexico and Arizona. And, um, and then I turned around and started heading back uh, on the southern route through- That's uh, what I would have said, I'm too tired to paint. Pardon? <laughs> And that's what I would have said. I'm too tired to paint. I'll wait till I get home. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, you know, actually, you know, I was good for about the last, well, the first five days. You know, after the- How many days were you out there? About two and a half weeks. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, by about the fifth or sixth day, it, it was getting a little, kind of, a, you know, the car was Literally. winning. Yeah, the car was definitely winning. It's like every time you sat in it, you know, it's like spots in your back and your hip really hurt, you know, because they've been in the car seat too long. So, uh, and since I was sleeping in it as well as driving in it and stuff, it, yeah. Yeah. By the, believe me, by the time that I got back to uh, Atlanta, I was uh, like, okay, enough of this. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not... You know, I'm not as young as I used to be, and I used to be able to get in the car and stay in, in the car for weeks, driving around doing stuff like that. Now, <laughs> yeah. four, four or five days, you know, and I'm ready to get off the road and camp in a hotel for a few days, you know, sleep in a real bed and take showers and stuff like that. So, but, uh, you know, it, 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 was a, it was a good adventure. It was a good learning lesson and uh, it's like, okay, you know, we, we know how to do it better next time. <laughs> no. You know, smaller bites. And spend, uh, the other thing is don't be so ambitious. And, um, and mainly what I was doing is I wasn't driving around painting. I was painting when I could, but mainly what I was doing was I was driving from house to house. Yeah, so. What, 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 what did you say you were doing? I was driving from house to house. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was out looking for a house. Uh -huh. shopping when you were yeah. didn't when you disappeared from us right well eventually that's going to happen yes you know whether it happens you know next week next month next year 10 years from now who knows but you know 10 years from now still yet to be determined but i did accomplish one thing on that adventure i bought a house so yay you know and it ended up being a lot closer than i thought it would be yeah. But the, uh, actually right there, I actually found the house that I really loved. And I really did love that house. The problem was it was in the middle of nowhere. And, yeah, and literally, know. like I said, it would be, yeah, it would be five and a half hours to any sign of civilization from there. Yeah. I mean, seriously, it would, you know. Yeah. And, and I, that's not just to go get art supplies. That's to get medical help. You know, there's not a hospital, there's not a hospital within 250 miles of that place. So not a good place when you're older. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about that. You know, I was kind of thinking, you know, when I was walking around that house, it's like, what is this going to be like in the middle of winter? We are in Missouri. And they they, they do get four or five feet of snow there. And uh, you know, if you're snowed in there for a month, a month and a half. And let's say that you burned yourself badly or fell off the ladder or something like that. Nobody's going to be able to get to you. You know, <laughs> you know, you pretty much so, you know, you're done. Huh? They have to call them and let them send a helicopter, huh? send a helicopter and raise you up from the house to the helicopter to take you to the hospital. Yeah, pretty much so. You know, you might as well at that point just open the front door, walk out in the snow and sit in it and just turn into a popsicle, you know? But uh, yeah, because it, it's going to take them, you know, a month or two to get to you. So, yeah. anyhow, 
that's a whole nother conversation. But uh, anyway, um, anybody uh, got any thoughts about all that fun stuff? It was fun. Are you going to do any uh, art critique today? Or? Uh, well, it's almost four o'clock. Uh, yeah, I got to go walk the dog, but I did want to tell you, I thought your your show for everybody, it looked like you docked it up all the pictures to make them all look good. <laughs> um, really, not really. I, yeah, I mean, I adjusted yeah. the contrast on some of them a little bit, but for the most it part, it was mainly good. just cropping it. You know, the hardest part and the thing that took me the, the most time was that most of you don't know how to take a photograph and square up the image yeah. in the photo. And so I ended up having to work in Photoshop to yeah. kind of distort them so that they looked square. Yeah. You know. I don't know. I don't know when to bend the, bend the camera forward, bend it back, or bend it to the side. I just need to fill it around till it looks right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, if it looks fairly square in the frame, that's all you really need. You know, that right. that is pretty decent light. So, you know, beyond that. Mm -hmm. What more can you ask for, right? Well, I could ask for, um, well, uh, sometimes, sometimes when you see the picture in, the mm -hmm. colors are, are, the, are totally different than, than what you see. Mm -hmm. You know, they might be brighter in some areas, brighter in some areas. And when you see, and I see it in, you don't see that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. Hmm. So you're saying, what what you're seeing on your computer screen versus what you're seeing when we get it up on the Zoom? Thing. Oh no no no! I'm saying what I've seen in what I see in when when I when I, when I see when I look at the actual picture I'm taking. Oh yeah. And then when I see on, on the computer, it's 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 not quite the same. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, again, you sometimes know, they don't have the same brightness. Yeah. Sometimes they don't have the same contrast. You know. Right. Well, that's again because your your eye sees about two hundred and fifty times better than the best digital camera out there. Okay. See, I mean it's incredible, you know. Really, when you start thinking about it, you know, your eye, <laughs> you know, there's not much out there that beats it. You know, I mean, you know, the range of color and contrast and detail that we see is amazing. I, I let, let me ask you this. I, I have a class in about eight minutes, but did you get anything from me at all? Yes, I did. Okay. okay. That that picture that I was, <laughs> that I was painting on the um mm -hmm. uh on the on the panel board, I yeah. would ask you uh, uh how how to make it come toward me because it just looked flat. I mean the, the ledge. And I didn't I didn't want to start the slide because uh we, we on Friday we, we do drawing, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, mainly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've answered that question for you already. It's contrast. <laughs> well, they, they, Bernice, the answer isn't going to change. It's contrast. <laughs> you know, more contrast yeah, to the foreground, less contrast to the background. Okay. I'm, I was just talking about the ledge part. I couldn't figure I know. it out. Yeah, but yeah. that's, you know. I mean, that's, that's I'll, okay. I'll look some more, try to figure it out. Some more. Yeah. I can't get that ledge right for nothing. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, yes, you guys did send some things in. Um, but uh, yeah, we're running kind of late here. Yeah, um, yeah, I got to go. Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, you know, we'll try to cover some of this stuff on Friday. Okay. You know the paintings you sent in stuff. So. Yeah, ho ho well, ho hopefully I would have saw them by myself on Friday. <laughs> okay, yeah, but if not, we're still here. So. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Charles. Enjoyed the class. Learned a lot. Okay. All right. Well, you guys have a good Thursday, and we will see you Friday morning about ten o'clock. Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, they will be sending out. Uh, they'll be sending out a new updated list. Uh, that should actually have the links for my classes on it. Okay. Okay. So you okay. should be getting one of those from from the powers that be. Bye bye. Bye. Right. Thank you. Bye.